Welcome to Organic Chemistry Part 1. Pleasure to be your teacher for the course, Dr. Mellican. And we have a lot to cover. Many of you are here taking Organic Chemistry as part of the prerequisite of your curriculum. Organic Chemistry is also a major topic for those of you that are going on to medical school, dentist school, things like that where you'll face organic chemistry on your MCAT exams and dental exams and going on to graduate school, graduate exams. Organic chemistry is so key. It is fundamental basically for the rest of chemistry that you'll encounter going on into biochemistry where a lot of your biology classes that you're taking will incorporate organic chemistry into it. So what we're going to do in this course as with the textbook by uh, Wade, uh, we're going to cover starting chapter one and then proceed uh, through uh, at least the first 10 or 11 chapters or so. So in chapter one, we'll start off with kind of a review of general chemistry. So most of the stuff will not seem very new, though we may tackle it uh, to a little higher degree than what you may have encountered in your general chemistry course, and then we'll venture off into some new things. So let's begin in chapter one by looking at what is organic chemistry, okay? If you look at the word organic, okay, it comes from the word for life. So organic chemistry was originally uh, studying the chemistry of life or the chemistry of molecules that are living, okay? So the molecules in our skin, in our organs, in our whole bodies, that's organic chemistry, okay? Or the chemistry that's found in animals, okay? Or things like that, okay? So that's where organic chemistry originally came from and what it has branched into that we study today is basically it's the chemistry of molecules that have carbon in them. Okay? What they found was that most living tissue has carbon-based molecules in it. So if we can understand the chemistry of carbon we can understand the chemistry of organic of life that is out there. And so that uh, is what this course is about. We're going to be dealing with the chemistry of carbon-based molecules. Okay? So we'll get into that, but let's go ahead and do a little review of things just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay. So, first thing that we want to review is the structure of an atom. Okay, so let me just draw kind of a crass structure of the atom. Okay, remember in the atom we have an inner core that's called the nucleus. Okay. And do you remember what was inside of the nucleus? We had what? Neutrons and protons. Okay. That I'll symbolize by an N and a P. Do you remember the charge on these things? The neutron N was neutral and the proton had a positive charge. Okay. So if you add these two together, what is the charge in a nucleus? Yes, it is positive. Okay, key point to remember. So the nucleus has a positive charge associated with it. Do you remember what was outside of the nucleus? It was electrons, wasn't it? That was symbolized by E, and those have negative charges. Okay. So the electrons 
remember, reside in what are called shells outside of the nucleus. Can you remember what it was that gave the size to an atom? It was the electrons, because those were the outer parts of the atom. Okay? The size was not due to the nucleus. The nucleus was what, what gave the atom mass. Okay? So that's where the mass is. Electrons are very light compared to uh, the neutrons, which are contributing mostly to the mass. But the electrons are what we want to focus on. Okay? Because the electrons not only deal with the size of the atom, but it also deals with the chemistry of the atom. And that's what we ultimately want to get to. So, remember in general chemistry that we covered this very important topic of electron configurations of atoms. Let's go ahead and review that a little bit. Let's, for example, look at an atom such as beryllium. Okay? And what we're going to do is look at an energy diagram where we're going to plot energy going up and these different slots are our subshells. Okay? So remember in the atom, if I could redraw things over here, that in an atom you had shells of electrons, n equals one shell, and n equals two shell, and n equals three shell, and so on. So you can see as I have electrons and further out shells, the atom starts getting bigger, doesn't it? Well, remember, inside each shell are subshells, so inside the n equals 1 shell is an s subshell. Inside the n equals 2 is an s and a p subshell, and so on. Okay? We're primarily just going to stick within the first two subshells. Remember that it's the subshell, write it down, that is the particular spot where the electrons go. Okay? The shell kind of gives the general area where the electron is. It's like if you come to school at Jackson State and somebody asks you, where are you right now? You could answer that in a lot of ways. You could say, I'm in Mississippi, or I'm in Jackson, Mississippi, or I'm on the campus of Jackson State, or I'm in the People's Science Building. Or you can get even more particular by saying, I'm in this seat in this particular room. And that's what subshells are. They're the particular seat where the electron resides. And so what we want to do is learn how to populate these subshells. Remember that each slot can hold a maximum of two electrons. Remember that? due to the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay? So the Pauli exclusion principle tells us that each subshell can hold a maximum of two electrons, and they have to be what? Of opposite spin. Okay? Well, with beryllium, beryllium has an atomic number of four, so it has a total of four electrons. So where do I start putting those four electrons in? I start at the bottom, according to what? The off-ball principle, okay? So the off-ball principle says I start at the lowest energy and I build up. 
And if I let these four electrons be represented by arrows, put the first one there, the second one there, so that those two are paired. And then I come up to the 2s, and I pair those two for a total of four. So if I were to translate this energy diagram to the electron configuration, beryllium would have the electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2. Remember these exponents are telling us the number of electrons in that subshell. Okay, so this was an easy one. Okay, this gets us started. Let's do another example. Since we're dealing in organic chemistry, let's look at carbon. Carbon, if you look at the periodic table, has a total of six electrons. That's what is, its atomic number is. So let's put six in here. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we match beryllium so far. Now, when I get to the 2p, remember that here these three energy slots are what are called degenerate. Okay, so what does degenerate mean? Write it down. It means that these energy slots are of the same energy. And when I put electrons into degenerate energy slots, I have to use my last rule, which is called Hund's rule. So remember what Hund's rule says? As I put one electron in each slot, Okay, of the same direction there. So put them in each slot till it's half filled, and then I go back and start pairing up. So with carbon, this is what I get. And if I translate that to the electron configuration, I get 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Okay. So even though these are in different ones, they're the same energy, so I combine them for the two up here. Okay. So this is a nice review of electron configurations, and we'll be using this as we move on into chapter two and get into some molecular orbital theory, okay? All right, well, let's look at another property of atoms. Another property that we want to be familiar with are what are called valence electrons. Valence electrons. Okay? So what are valence electrons? Write it down. These are the outermost electrons in a shell. These are the outer shell electrons. Let's maybe apply this to carbon. Here we did the electron diagram for carbon. Where is the outer shell for carbon? Okay. Well, here's the first shell. Here's the second shell. So the second shell combines both the 2s and the 2p. So the next question we 
commonly ask is how many electrons are in this valence shell? Well, there's what? One, two, three, four. Okay. So we have four valence electrons or carbon. Okay. The other two that are down here, remember what are called inner core electrons. Or what we can just call core electrons. Okay. So carbon has four valence electrons. Another way we could have seen that carbon has four valence electrons is by looking at the group. If you look at the group number for carbon, it falls under group four. Okay. And so here we find a, a very important property of the periodic table that the group number always gives you the number of valence electrons with that atom. Okay. And that's a very important property. If you look at other atoms in group four, not only have carbon, but you have silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. Okay? Of course, as I go down, I'm getting more and more electrons and further and further shells. Okay? But all of these atoms at the outer shell, or their valence electrons, all have four there. Okay? They all have four valence electrons. Okay? So that saves you from having to write out the electron configuration and having to wait till the end of it and see how many that you have. Okay? So this is a very important property. You know? And another example is sulfur. Okay? I could write out the electron configuration and try to find the valence electrons, or I can use the periodic table as my friend. Sulfur, if you look, is in group six, and so how many valence electrons does it have? It has six, okay? That's all I have to do, is use the tool as my friend. I don't have to do all the hard work Okay. So you might ask, what is the value of valence electrons? What's the purpose of them? Is it just to ascribe a name to them? Okay. Or do they have a specific purpose? And they do. Valence electrons These are the electrons that are involved in bonding, okay? And that's what we want to do. We want to build molecules, okay? But in order to build molecules, I have to build bonds between atoms, okay? So let's take a look at how this works. electrons because it's in group four. And what I can do is write a Lewis dot symbol for carbon. And remember what you can do is draw a line or kind of like a box around carbon where each line can hold a maximum of two valence electrons. Okay. So you can see that the maximum valence electrons would be what? Two, four, six, eight, if indeed that 
Adam had eight. Okay, those would only be for the uh, inert gases and some others that we'll look at later. But for carbon, we have four. So what we do is we start representing an electron with a dot. So we put one in one line, another in another line, third, and then four. So if I would have had five, I then would have came back and started pairing up. Okay? So let's get rid of this line stuff. And so that would be the Lewis dot symbol for carbon. Okay? What about oxygen? Okay? Oxygen is in group six. So it has six valence electrons. So let's draw the Lewis dot symbol for oxygen. Okay? We don't need the lines anymore. That's for grade school stuff. Let's go ahead and draw our dots. One, two, three, four, pair up five and six. Okay? So note that oxygen has two lone pair. And it has two single electrons. Okay? Note that carbon did not have any lone pair on it. Okay? Let's do one more. Let's look at fluorine. Fluorine is all the way over in group seven. Okay? So it will have seven valence electrons. So let's draw them. One, two, three, four, pair up, five, six, and seven. Okay? So you can see fluorine, as well as all the halogens, which will look like fluorine, has one, two, three lone pair, and one single electron. Okay? So this is a review of how to use valence electrons to draw our Lewis dot symbols. And now what we'll do is take this to the next step and look at how to make molecules. Okay? So this brings up the important topic of what are called Lewis structures. Lewis structures. Very, very important. Hope you mastered this in general chemistry. If not, you have a second chance to do it now. With Lewis structures, what you are given is a molecular formula of the atom. Okay, which is basically the recipe of the molecule. Okay. So you're given the molecular formula for the molecule, not the atom. And we want to draw the structure, or what's called the Lewis structure for it. So what we do is we break up all the atoms into their individual pieces. Okay. That's the first thing you do. You may want to write that down. The second thing we do is we draw the valence electrons on each atom. So with hydrogen, it's in group one. So it gets one measly valence electron. And oxygen, we just saw, was in group six. So it had six valence electrons, something like that. So that's the second rule. And the third rule is the fun rule. Just like you did when you were a little kid, we play connect the dots. Connect the dots. In other words, we're going to connect 
the single electrons. So we can connect these two and we can connect those two. Okay? We connect single electrons. Okay? And then each connection stands for a bond. And so we get our final Lewis structure, which would look like that. Okay? So both of these circles were bonds. And then note, these lone pair came along for the ride on oxygen. I have to make sure I show those. Okay? So make sure you show these lone pair. Okay? Lone pair electrons were not used in the bonding. But these down here were bonding. So we have bonding electrons there. How many are in there? We have two, don't we? And we have two bonding electrons in that bond. Okay. So always remember what this line represents. It represents two electrons that have been connected together. One question that students generally ask is, how did you know to connect these two? You could have connected this hydrogen and this hydrogen, but then you would have left oxygen all by itself. There's one important rule that you want to remember. And this is the rule for what is the middle atom. Write it down. The middle atom that is going to be connected to the others is the one with the most single electrons. The middle atom is the one with the most single electrons. So oxygen had two and hydrogen only had one. So that's why the hydrogens had to be connected to the oxygen. Okay. So this very simple one with water, if you understood this, this will carry you a very long way. Let's look at some more examples. Let's look at one with carbon in there, such as CH3Cl. Okay, so here we have a lot more atoms to deal with, so let's draw these. Okay, so there's our first rule where we have broken apart all the atoms. You'll note I put carbon in the middle. You'll see why in a second. I kind of cheated. We now draw the valence electrons. Okay, so hydrogen has one on each of those. Carbon is group four. So there we get four singles. And then chlorine is group seven. And so we get that with one single there. Now you can see why I put carbon in the middle, because it has four single electrons. Okay? Carbon will always go in the middle if I have a carbon atom. It makes it very simple. Okay? This is one of the special properties of carbon for organic chemistry, is that these singles enable carbon to bond to a lot of different atoms. 
So now we can play connect the dots. And everything connects very nicely. So if we drew this out, we would get this Lewis structure here. Where, again, notice I had to carry through the lone pair on the chlorine, three of them. So I have to make sure I show those. Okay? If valence electrons are not used in a bond, then they will be shown as lone pair. Okay? So make sure you keep a note of that. Okay. Let's keep doing a few more examples. Let's look at this one here, CH2O. What kind of Lewis structure would it have? Well, let's break up the atoms. Okay. Again, since I have a carbon there, I know it's going to be the middle atom. So hydrogen has one. Carbon has four. And oxygen has a total of six. Okay. So here, let's play connect the dots. So carbon and hydrogen pair up nicely. Now, I got two singles here and two singles here. So, I can make two different circles between carbon and oxygen. So if I write this out, I get a Lewis structure like this where these two loops now give me a double bond. Okay. And I have my two bonds to hydrogen and the lone pair on oxygen. Okay. So this is an introduction to how we can get a double bond. Okay. And you may be asking, does it matter how these bonds point? No, not for right now. So you could draw these bonds in any direction that you want. You could have drawn the hydrogen horizontal or however you wanted to do it. Okay, so don't matter. Don't worry about how you point those bonds at this time. Okay, let's do another example. Let's look at HCN. Okay. So here we split up the atoms. Then we draw our valence electrons. Nitrogen has five, because it's in group five. And then it has three singles here. So now we can connect the dots. 
hydrogen and carbon. And now what? Carbon and nitrogen, we can loop three times to give us now what? A triple bond. So this molecule has a triple bond, and the nitrogen carries forth its lone pair on the side there. Okay, again, it doesn't matter how you drew those lone pair too. You could draw them here, you could have put them here or here. It doesn't matter, at least for right now. Okay. So this is our introduction to Lewis structures. Okay. In our next class, we'll continue this and then go on to some other topics as we continue to look at carbon-based molecules.